Welcome to the NU Digital Classroom. In today's class, we're going to be looking at this idea of determinants of psychological health and some of the ideas we can take from psychology around understanding things like empathy and decision making and collaboration and these ideas and these words that we hear everywhere. But how do we go beyond just these words and how do we actually have meaningful understandings of other people that can help create meaningful experiences and also therapeutic effects on others. All right, I'm glad you're here. Hope you're doing well. Let's get into it. When you look into their eyes, you know somebody is home. They're an animal that possesses great spiritual power not to be meddled with. We need SO to respond for a dead person at SeaWorld. A whale has eaten one of the trainers. Tilikum, though, is the one that went after her. Don is the senior trainer here at Shamu Stadium. She captured what it means to be a SeaWorld trainer, that it made me realize what happened to her really could have happened to anyone. I've been expecting somebody to be killed by a telecom. We weren't told much about it, other than it was trainer error. It didn't just happen. It's not a singular event. You have to go back to understand this. The speedboat herded them in, and they could just pick out the young ones. This is the worst thing that I've ever done. When Tilikum arrived at SeaWorld, he was twice as large as the next animal. We stored these whales in what we call a module, which was 20 feet across and 30 feet deep, and the lights were all turned out. Probably led to what I think is a psychosis. All whales in captivity are all psychologically traumatized. It's not just Tilikum. If you were in a bathtub for 25 years, don't you think you'd get a little psychotic? Dawn would tell you that it was her mistake. They blamed her. It's just a bold-faced lie. I was just instructed to get rid of the day. The industry has a vested interest in spinning these. That sells a lot of Shamu dolls. It sells a lot of tickets at the gate. There's no record of an orca doing any harm in the wild. Silicon, the largest orca in captivity at 22 feet long, 22 feet 6 inches, 12,000 pounds. He fathered 22 calves, only 10 are still alive today. His sperm is the father of, well, he's the father of almost all the orcas in captivity. I want you to think about Tilikum for a bit and I want to use this example of orcas as an opportunity to talk about what does it mean to put yourself in something else's experience psychologically? What's the psychology of these animals and the trauma they experience? The underlying point of my message today is this idea of that to understand what it's like for the orca in the movie like Blackfish. And I remember when Blackfish first came out and shown it to my students and everyone was so upset. And the most upsetting thing about Blackfish or movies like Blackfish or The Cove is that those situations are still bad now. And, you know, Tilikum recently died. And I think it's, it's... I'm going to be making the point that why you should care is because when you have an animal as complex as an orca, as a killer whale, is that they have these advanced social 
embodied intelligences that live in a community level. They're, they're part of a pack. They're a social animal that has emotional systems that are more advanced than ours. They have aspects of the prefrontal cortex that we don't have that process social emotional information. So the connection between mom and baby orca is maybe literally unintelligible to the human mind. They have aspects of connection that we don't have. And it's this part of the brain of the, the orca dolphin, which is obviously a dolphin and some of the other large tooth whales that seem to be responsible for memory formation and emotion. So think of how those two things are connected, like the idea of who mom is, the idea of who baby is, is and how that relates to self and what the difference even is between self and kin, between self and child, that the orca baby stays with the mom its whole life sometimes, that they're in these advanced pods with the mothers raising the kids. Right, so to understand the trauma of pulling the baby from the mom, we need to understand the depth of the psycho-emotional social connection between mom and baby. Mom is baby, psychologically. I thought that you might find it interesting to know that orcas may be even more emotionally developed than humans, right? And this is, I mentioned this part of this extra part of the brain scans, the MRI scans have shown that the brain lobes that deal with emotions are enlarged in orcas, that they actually have cortex areas yeah, contextual areas, areas of cortex that that we don't have, that the human brain doesn't have. And why am I making this point? I'm about to make this point that then stripping the child from the mom is pure agony, pure agony, pure emotionally heavy, cognitively full, socially devastating agony. Unlike other mammals, because orcas, yeah, orcas typically stay with the mums their whole life. So, and it, this is the tough thing about life is that it doesn't even know it has that impulse. So if you rip baby from mom early, baby will still have that impulse to be with mom its whole life. And then that just gets warped and distorted into right like later in our course we're going to talk about ideas like attachment and stuff like that and i'm sort of talking about that and i'm this is deeper than attachment though this is closer to um straight up imprinting mom's mind and baby are so connected baby shamu i know it was naive of me but i thought that it was our responsibility to do as much as we could to keep their family units together since we knew that in the wild that's what happens yes sir that's our baby what? kalina was the first baby shamu baby shamu sea world's newest star Don't she had become quite disruptive uh and challenging her mom a little bit and disrupting some shows and that kind of thing she's got the whole place jumping shamu she's our baby whale it was decided by the higher-ups that she would be moved to another park when she was just four, four and a half years old. And that was uh, news to us as trainers that were working with her. To me, it had never crossed my mind that they might be moving the baby from her mom. The supervisors um, basically was kind of mocking me, like, oh, you're saying poor Kalina? You know, what's she gonna do without her mommy? And you know, and that, of course, just shut me up. <laughs> so the night of the move, we had to deploy the nets to separate them and get Kalina, the baby, into the med pool. And Katina was was generally a quiet whale. She was not an uh, overly vocal whale. Um, after Kalina was removed from the scene um, and put on the truck and taken to the airport, and Katina, her mom, was left in the pool. She stayed in the corner of the pool, um, like, literally just shaking and 
screaming, screeching, crying. Like, um, I'd never seen her do anything like that. Um, and the other females in the pool, maybe once or twice during the night, they'd come out and check on her, and she'd screech and cry, and they would just run back. There was nothing that you could call that watching it besides grief. Those are not your whales. You know, you love them, and you think, I'm the one that touches them, feeds them, keeps them alive, gives them the care that they need. They're not your whales. They own them. Kasaka and Takara were very close. Kasaka was the mother. Takara is the calf. Takara was special to me. They were inseparable. When they separated Kasaka and Takara, it was to take Takara to Florida. Once Takara had already been stretchered out of the pool, put on the truck, driven to the airport, Kasaka continued to make vocals that had never been heard before. They brought in the senior research scientists to analyze the vocals. They were long range vocals. She was trying something that no one had even heard before looking for Takara. That's heartbreaking. How can anyone look at that and think that that is morally acceptable? It's not. It is not okay. the worst thing you could do to both of them. The most torturous thing you could do to either of them is to separate them. So I want you to check this out. So this was read by the Dolphin Project, Rickleberry. Uh, if you've seen the movie The Cove, it's kind of the team behind that. Rickleberry was actually the actor in the hit show Flipper, when I was little, that was like a huge show. It's probably the first time I ever heard of what a dolphin was. And this guy had like a friend dolphin. Flipper was the name of the dolphin. And Rickleberry was the guy that had the friend dolphin. And he was like a movie star. Like as big of a Hollywood... Just, just Google Rickleberry Flipper. He was as big of a Hollywood honk superstar as, as they come. But then he went through this like long period of depression and self-analysis because he basically views himself as highly responsible for this whole captivity movement around dolphins and whales. And this is a point that was made at the UN. And I want to kind of make this point that if you look at the title, right, are orcas non-human persons? And I know that sounds weird, but note that they're saying like very clearly non-human. The, the point being made here is not that they're like humans. It's that their level of psychology might be advanced enough that they could be granted personhood. The species of topic today is one who has demonstrated many human-like qualities, including intelligence, language, an exquisite sense of emotional capability. Orcus orca, the killer whale. These massive toothed whales are homed in the, cold, in the cold waters of the northern Atlantic, the North Pacific, the Antarctic, but dwell in vast expanses around the sea, sometimes swimming hundreds of miles a day. Think of hundreds of miles a day, like where I live in Kitchener. That's like here to Toronto and back every day. That's not going to maybe be as relevant for you if you're not from this area, but it's a huge distance. It's basically like, well, it's like driving 100 kilometers an hour for an hour. That's how far they would go roughly in a day. The largest killer whale ever found stretched up to 10 meters. Huge. Weighing 10 tons, 20,000 pounds. However, not only are their bodies massive, these massive whales, right? We call them killer whales. You all know they're dolphins. The largest dolphin. 
Not only are they massive, so too are their brains. Postmortem after death MRI studies on the killer whale brain have shown that it's on the scale of 3.5 to 6.5 times as massive as the common bottlenose dolphin, right? Depending on the size of the whale, if it's a male or a female. That's why there's a range. It demonstrates non human person like qualities. So you might be thinking like, Mike, we're doing a developmental psych child development class. Why are we talking about this example with animal psych psychology and whales specifically and killer whales more specifically? It's like, empathy is a psychological state. If you felt something watching that video of the whale, you experienced an empathetic connection. Empathy is not an idea. It's an applied ability to emotionally engage in a psychologically immersive situation. Be so present that you're actually engaged. I'm gonna make the argument, this is the trick of therapy. This is counseling 101. This is, but not 101, because 101 implies like basics. The first, this is like advanced counseling that at the end of the day, no one cares about your theory. Your theory is great. If you can form a relationship where the person actually trusts you, takes you seriously, thinks you actually give a, give a whatever about them. It's like, if you don't think I'm listening to you, if you think I'm like waiting for you to finish what you're saying so I can just say back what I've prepackaged and what I've said to everyone else. And if you don't think I genuinely care and I'm interested in you, it's like, it doesn't matter what I say as a psychologist. It doesn't matter what you say as a social worker, as a teacher. I'm gonna use this to leapfrog into talking about Carl Rogers, but the idea here is that empathy is a psychological state. It's, it's what you felt. It's the connection you felt and that that's actually something or that you didn't feel. And it's that, that's what we're gonna be talking about, this idea of empathy and what do we actually mean by it? Because empathy is not necessarily always good. Right, you're more likely to empathize with people that look like you and that are like you background wise, which also makes you more likely to outgroup people that aren't like that. So empathy is this ability to relate with others, but we have to be aware of how it works because it also can put us in situations where our, our bioevolutionary bio programming almost predisposes us to respond to certain things certain ways. And again, if you wanna be a free thinking person, which I hope all of you do, you know, we need to be aware of when our conditioning is getting, well, what's our conditioning and what's you? What's your persona? What's your social mask self? And what's your real self? Sorry to keep pointing at the screen. I'm just all emotional from the whale videos. But like, at the end of the day, it's a fight for definition. What is, what is humanity? Who are you? What are you doing here? What do we mean that you want to get into a field and help people? People have complicated, super multivariable problems. The first thing is you have to hear what they're saying. You have to not assume that you have to, not, you know, Freud, you know, you, you have to watch for transference. Don't, they're not just like the person that you think they look like. It's a unique human with this complex psychodynamic. How's that for a weirdly defined slide? Okay, so if you can just have that point though, right? Because this whole rant was just to basically make this point that it's a felt, it's it's an experienced, in the moment, engagement with your world. Empathy is just a made up word to try to describe what, that when you're engaged in that kind of psychologically involved, emotionally charged scenario, you're just processing the world differently. You're processing other people differently. You're opening up channels for communication that don't otherwise exist. Okay, my rant on the last slide, I kind of stole my point here, but if you could have this point that this is this word, okay, so I'm gonna make this jump into, and again, this is sort of why I'm calling this a special presentation because I understand that this isn't completely child psychology, but it totally is too because 
It's part of this broader story, and Carl Rogers' voice is an important aspect of developmental psychology, whether it's in the textbook or not, because he's really making this point that, and this point has complete relevance to if you're a teacher of young kids or if you're a parent, that when you're trying to understand from their perspective, even just that, even if you're not very good at it, even if you're just making the mental effort to try to understand how they're being experiencing it, because of this part of your brain that we call mirror neurons, you're actually pretty good at doing it. It's not you're not going to be able to mind read their intentions and stuff, but it's like if you can if you really try to think about what it's like. Like for me teaching you at Nipsing from my house in Kitchener, where I sort of don't know you, but I actually quite like you. Like you're all being very nice to me and stuff, and it's like you don't have to work that hard to kind of be like, ah, oh, it's probably kind of like this. And it's like, as soon as you do that mental exercise, now all of a sudden your ability to communicate me with me is stronger. Now, keep in mind, you're communicating with your idea of me. And Rogers would stress that a lot in his writings, right? Like not to forget this. It's an important skill to be able to use and utilize in the moment while remembering that you're using a skill and you're not like a master mind reader that actually knows you're trying to like and you're not trying to read their mind you're trying to empathize with their position you're trying to develop this channel for empathic understanding that is basically this deeper connection where you're actually listening you're kind of looking past the cover story and you're trying to see who is this person what are they trying to say why are they being like this in this situation and that this like especially in a counseling situation and that this pursuit of empathic understanding opens up these avenues and channels of communication and insight that aren't normally available because people have so many defenses and guards up because life's complex and to walk around your life that exposed is a high level of vulnerability and people have developed ways of not being that vulnerable And the idea here is that, like, if you're talking in this level, it's like the difference between a good conversation and just a small talk conversation that never gets past that phase. And you've all experienced examples of it. So if you could jot this table down somehow, it's like this table is actually really important and it looks almost simple, but there's a lot contained in it and it's actually pretty insightful. And it's looking at, like, what we actually, kind of this idea of applied empathy or emotional intelligence, which I'm going to talk about in, in a bit. And there's been qu questions around the validity of emotional intelligence as like a psychometric. Um, meaning like how much I can give you a score and give the person beside you a score and how much that actually means anything in relation to performance. They've struggled making it a robust psychometric, although there's some pretty good scales that do exist now. But that's all kind of the attempt to operationalize the concept. The concept is very strong. This idea of emotional intelligence that there's different levels of processing your environment and yourself in your environment. And there's like this personal level that's looking at like, well, self-awareness and self-management, sort of like how aware you are of yourself, how you wear aware you are of self. A good example of self-management would be like your ability to not let yourself spiral into negative moods, your ability to recognize if you're starting to get upset and actually choose to do something about it that's not just continuing to get upset. Even though you might be justified to be upset. Starting to have that almost witnessing your behavior and being able to be aware of it and also manage it. So this is kind of what we would call maturing, but in different language, but it's like actually a pretty good concept. And this is actually to use very psychological language. You could say it's like yourself watching your ego. to use like old school Freudian or that's actually more Carl Jung and then social competence so so you think about what the word competence means it's like you know I in a way you could have just competence kind of means applied utilizable skill 
Whereas another word you could kind of use is, uh, what's the word I was just about to switch it to? My freestyle here, I just lost it. Oh yeah, maturity. It's like, but that kind of, because maturity and development are obviously similar words, right? Like a mature plant is one that's at a later stage of development. But competence kind of implies this like usable technical skill, which is relevant here. And then at the social level, there's social competence, right? Like your ability to read situations. So notice how the what I see is like, it sounds simple, right? But it's really like, okay, you're walking through this world. Your life is you walking through this world, processing your environment, right? And it's, your brain's so good at it that unless you actually take time to pause and think about it, you don't realize that there's this processing is going on. It's all like under the waves, right? Freud would say it's the iceberg under the water. But if you start to kind of pull back a tiny bit and be, develop some awareness of that and start to see how Later on, a psychologist by the name of William Glasser is going to come up with this idea of choice theory and basically say, like, if you can pull back a little bit and realize that there's a lot of little minor choices all over spread through this seemingly just world that affects us, that we can actually choose how we engage different scenarios. When William Glasser is going to go on to say, like, the biggest psychological protective skill, I'm making this up, but just to get close to his quote, because I can't remember it. But basically the idea that the strongest psychological skill is the ability to choose a good thought over a bad thought. And that's like purposely sort of vague, right? It's like, oh, that's, you're about to write it down and it's like, choose a good thought over a bad thought. I go super simple on you, but it's like, in some ways that's the most profound idea. A lot of us sometimes, if we could choose a good thought over a bad thought, now that doesn't necessarily mean happy, Right? Good doesn't necessarily mean happy and bad means sad. Anyways, I got lost down that rabbit hole. And then the what I do, this idea that like, I already kind of talked about the self-management relationship management, right? Like you, if you have this social awareness, this developing ability to read the environment, like does it shape your behavior? Does it shape how you engage others? Does it shape when your wife or husband or boyfriend or girlfriend comes in the room and you can tell they've had a bad day and you can tell that if you bring up the thing that you were wanting to bring up that's a problem, that this isn't a good time and do you bring it up anyways? Or do you develop a skill called skill diplomacy, which is basically like this idea that the same thing brought up different times at a different time in a different situation with a different tone of voice with a different preceding conversation is going to be interpreted really differently so when you have those things that you want especially if you're trying to create some kind of behavioral change in the person you're living with around habits like not doing a certain thing like leaving dishes or whatever the problem is it's like remember the situation in which the idea is presented matters another weird way to end a slide but okay next one so the real kind of cornerstone book on this idea of emotional intelligence and this idea sort of as a robust psychological concepts really linked to Goldman's book. Um, and if you, if uh, Daniel Goldman, I should, I could include it in this, but I'll just tell you, he has like a good te a TED talk on emotional intelligence is pretty good. But you get the idea. My, my point isn't just like, let's talk about what emotional intelligence is you probably already heard of it let's talk about its parts or whatever it's like the real goal of saying this is this has to be an applied skill or it's nothing or else it's just like a self-reflection exercise i'm trying to say like it needs it for you and me both it needs to be something that we don't just learn about and then forget but actually realize oh yeah okay so you know as much as it is easy to just kind of do what we feel like especially when we're in a bad mood it's like Maybe you're um, well, just engaging in behaviors that are more pattern repetition than what you need to be doing. Goldman says there's this ability to recognize feelings as they happen. So notice that as they happen really is implying this like mindful engagement with right now that you're present. The ability to recognize feelings as they happen is the cornerstone of emotional intelligence. I should have had as they happen bolded 
and that people who are more in touch with their feelings are better able to navigate their lives and more competent decision makers. It's not just that it's like nice and this is the other thing. It's like sometimes because of the language and just because it has the word emotional in it, it's like people would think that this is somehow about just being nicer. It's like, no, we're talking about the fact that the world is super complicated and there's so much nuance and detail and so much complexity and being able to navigate that and actually make good decisions is difficult, especially if your decision making is being heavily influenced by emotions, which are notorious for having huge effects on proper decision making, which you'll catch later in my hot cognitions presentation. Okay, that's next term, but I, I'm going to do a whole, sorry, I got a little bit like radio show announcer-ish, but uh, next term I'm going to do, I think it's next term, I'm going to, yeah, do a presentation called hot cognition, which is basically looking at this idea of how the cognitive system gets compromised when we're in charged emotional states. So we'll come back to that talk. So I want to kind of, because I understand that you've heard of some of these theorists before and probably even some of these ideas before, and I want to really try to emphasize that the reason I think there's value in talking about this is like, well, basically the point like, okay, so you've heard of these aspects of active listening, right? You've heard about active listening before that you need to like attend and like, you know, maintain eye contact, do a little bit of head nodding to show acknowledgement or just like even how your bodily position towards the person that you're asking questions to show that you're listening, that you're maybe summarizing or paraphrasing things that you say that sometimes you're using silence as like almost a skill. And if you take a counseling class, I'll talk about that. And then this inclusion of empathy, but then the question is like, okay, but you know, from a behavioral perspective, if we were to observe your interactions with people, are you demonstrating this? Right. And so, and, and, you know, the same critical question could be asked towards myself. It's like, not always, definitely not, not always with my kids, not always with my wife, not always with like people I work with. Like, I think with students, I'm, I usually try to be pretty good that way, but it's like, especially when you're like, think about when you're tired and when you're busy and when you're feeling overwhelmed, it's like, are you really listening? Or are you just trying to process through the situation fast? And it's like, if we're honest, sometimes we're trying to process through the situation fast. The thing is, is that the lesson from Rogers is that people notice that and that, especially in a, in a therapeutic setting, if somebody's in a scenario where they're fearing rejection, you know, they might be coming to talk to you about something they've never talked to people about before. And or they might be, they might have been rejected by friends and stuff at times that they brought stuff up. And so how they're in this like very specific state. And so they're almost like hypersensitive to cues that you might not even knowingly give off that show a lack of interest, a lack of care that you're disgusted by what they say, all these kind of things. So you have to keep in mind this idea that they're going to be hypersensitive to those kind of cues. So it's not just about acting fakely interested. And that's what Roger says. If you come across as acting fakely interested, that's even almost worse than coming across as being uninterested. It's like you have to actually care or else it's going to be really hard to be an effective therapist. And care doesn't mean, here's another point for a side rant. To be a good helper, you have to let people's problems stay their problems. They can't become your problems. It's not fair to them. It's the hardest lesson for anyone in the field that you're going into. It's a very hard lesson for me. It's like, because you have to maintain your ability to, to help with problems. You're a problem solver. You're not a problem. You, so the best writing on this, and I'm struggling to explain it because it's a complex idea, right? Because you're trying to go deep into the connection with the person, care about it, try to help them, and then be able to leave that mode. Not because you're a cold person, but because you understand that that's what you need to do if you're going to have any kind of long-term career and not burn out hardcore right away. Because 
and that you can do that and that it's not fake. And again, I'm going to keep referencing Carl Rogers that if anyone's like interested in getting into counseling, you need to be reading Carl Rogers because he kind of teaches how to do that in a way that's real and not fake. Right, and like, because here's the thing, it's like you're on day one, your first client, it's like easy to be interested. What if you're on like year 15, it's your fourth client, you're in an argument with your wife or husband about something, you you can hear the kids upstairs, there's noise outside, like the dog barking right now, it's like, are you paying full attention then? And it's like, to acknowledge that that can be an issue, and so, okay, so how do you stay engaged? That's the real question, right? It's like, that's something to be developed. And one way I'm going to stay engaged on the next slide is close the window because the dog's barking super loud. But that's just me trying and failing to make a joke because there's no live people here. So remote schooling. Anyways, love you all. And I hope that you like this class. I'm going to kill this slide because I'm at like five minutes and I'm getting weird with my rant. So I'll see you on the next slide. Okay, the window has been closed. Oh, I forgot to... Uh, I had the, did you notice the music? I don't know if that's cool or not. If you can write me and say if it's cool or not. I had, a, I was thinking like, because sometimes when I re-listen to this, you can hear the computer a little bit, like the, you know, I'm, I'm doing this on a little bit of a duct tape together system and like my computer's not the greatest. It's not that bad. It's pretty powerful, but it has like a hum to it. So I thought that back with the classical music could kind of cancel it a bit. Anywho... So empathy is defined in counseling is this is kind of the point I'm trying to make is that it's not just doing it. It's doing it and it being understood in the moment by the other person is that it's like it's not just me caring about what you say because think about it all the time. There's so many times where someone could be saying something you could care about it, but you're not really to them. It looks like you don't care. Roger says that sounds like a like a little thing that's so important. It's so important. Think about how you've changed in response to people you felt weren't listening. And just notice it. Notice it when you go next time to the store, or next time you see a doctor, or next time you see a friend or something. It's like, and I don't mean, maybe not your friends. Don't like start super analyzing your friends. That, But I mean like, how people respond to you treats how you engage, affects how they engage how people respond to you affects how you engage them, which affects how they respond to you. And when we understand that process and we understand that, okay, well then, how can we maximize the therapeutic ability of that statement? Right, and so it's, it's this idea of empathy standing in this, this is kind of like a little bit of a corny picture that there's you and me and then there's we, but... I forget what I was thinking when I put that in the slide, but it makes sense. It's just this idea of it. And, you know, if you want to get really neuro, uh, like in terms of like neuroscience, there's actually are things called mirror neurons. And it's just the word like a mirror in your bathroom neuron. And if you wanted to Google that, I should maybe throw a video of that in. They're super cool. And what a mirror neuron basically is, is it. I think I might have actually shown you a video that had a reference to it, but it's why, like, if you see someone get injured in, or cut or something in a movie and you kind of go like this too, or like you see someone get scared and you go like this, or you feel like the pull of a movie, it's like that there's part of your brain that's actually starting to mirror up and align with the main character. It happens when you're reading too, big time, almost more when you're reading because you're in that world longer, right? So if you're reading like some, where to put it? But anyways, I'm reading a great book that I keep pushing to people, but it's called The uh, Wizard's First Rule or something like that. But it's a cool book, and it's like the main character is uh, cool. Anyways, it's like my whole point of that is like you start to kind of see things the way that the character sees it. It's like that's actually – there's something happening in your brain, and it's involving these things called mirror neurons. Empathy needs to be expressed to be effective. An empathetic process is not complete until the client's had the opportunity. See, this is the thing is, is like it because how you're doing it and how it's being read by them is the important intervariable that the empathic process isn't complete until clients have an opportunity to confirm, correct, embellish. So like basically comment on your interpretation. 
you're trying to get a read of their situation and as you're trying to get a read of their situation you're asking them questions and you're it's it sounds to me like blah 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 and when you talk about this it's kind of and, and you're doing all these things that we call kind of just like the communicative skills of counseling and as you're doing that you're communicating to them your either understanding or lack of understanding with what they're talking about the secret to therapeutic empathy have this uh this is a pretty decent paragraph for your notes that empathizing in this context in this therapeutic context occurs when we feel an appropriate emotional reaction an emotion triggered by the other person's emotion so maybe i'm really getting into the story they're sharing and i'm feeling their pain it's being done though in this kind of intentional way attempt to understand the other person to help understand and maybe even predict behavior and to help connect or think of resonate like frequency wise with them emotionally to try to see their world and understand their feelings and appreciate them as human beings and communicate that we understand now again this is where it's a it's a it's a psychotherapeutic skill we're not mind melding with them we're not like pretending like we're them we're trying to use our cognitive abilities to best contextualize their story and the best way we can contextualize or kind of build the story around their story or the world in which their story lives is by trying to see how they're experiencing it I think I lost that point at the end, but I think I it was a pretty good point for most of that rant. But yeah, just that idea of like, it's a cognitive, emotional, applied skill that aids understanding so that you can better help people's decision-making and problem-solving challenges, which is basically what counseling is. Okay, so, so I don't mess up the recording and throw them all up. Okay, so Rogers talks about the great Carl Rogers talks about these five elements of empathy. So now think about this is he's like saying, okay, so if we're going to break down what empathy actually is, and again, we're not just, we're talking about it from this perspective of using it as this applied emotional psycho, psycho, um, uh, visualization and kind of ability to put yourself in the position of the other person is, and again, we're, I know this sounds a little bit weird, but it's because your friend's telling you a story about a breakup they're going through and you're trying to experience yeah that is shattering for them because it does have to do with how where they're living and and how it's going to affect their family function on the weekend and you're trying to kind of build the story of why this is so relevant to this person not just relevant that's not the right word but what are the complexities of the situation to this person you're almost entering their private perceptual world now again sensation perception we talked about the difference last week it's like people are making sense of the world they're in you're trying to understand how they're making sense of it you're being sensitive moment to moment so staying present to the changing felt meanings in this other person right so this person's in this state of chaos maybe we'll say and they're when you're in a state of chaos the world looks dangerous and they're some things happen to somebody that's shattered their story of how things are and they're in this state of vulnerability and this their experience of this is overwhelming and they have these changing felt meanings or experiences that that they're dealing with and it's almost like you're temporary live temporarily living in their life moving about it delicately without making judgments trying to feel the sense meanings of what they're saying and talking about meaning like you're saying this and when you're saying this like you wouldn't necessarily say this but like you're noticing that every time they talk about this one person they're getting visibly upset to be an example of the sensed meaning you're noticing that and then however you might not you have to be kind of careful right so rogers would say be careful with that it's like you don't necessarily want to be like well every time you talk about your dad you get all tense and maybe the person's not ready to talk about their dad that way yet like it's like one of the things in therapy is timing and knowing when to bring things up and also knowing when even if you have an insight that might be interesting to you conceptually that thought might be devastating to the person to the person's story 
their internalized world. And so how you address that is with the most extreme delicateness and skill because well, because it, it demands that. So yeah, so I'm basically trying to say this idea that like people have their own, they're going through their world and their story of their problem isn't just the hard details, it's also their perception of that and what it means to them and you're trying to almost experience what they're experiencing about it because that actually is where there's often the issue, right? And it's like, and if you're going to help them therapeutically, you're talking to that a little bit because when people get overwhelmed by their problems, they oftentimes get overwhelmed by seeing themselves in their problems. And so it's like it couldn't be more dynamic and complicated because it's deeply connected with how they see themselves, how they see other people, how they what they think relationships are, what trust issues, things like identity, things like social standing, what they think their purpose in life is. All these things get in this and it's and they might not even be able to articulate any of that. It might just be felt as this confusing angst. So I just have three quotes here I want to show you from Rogers about this topic and I'm going to move on from the specifically empathy in just a second, but Roger says this, to my mind, empathy itself is the healing agent. And remember, I've talked about Rogers as like maybe the most important psychologist to influence what we now call counseling. And he's saying like, maybe it's that psychological skill itself that's what heals people in counseling, in counseling, being in that kind of depth of engagement with somebody. So remember, he's also talking to a specific audience that at his time he's thinking people are getting too obsessed with, oh, I'm a Freudian, I'm a Jungian, I'm an Adlerian, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm whatever, a cognitivist, a behavioralist. And it's like, his point is like, okay, don't get too caught up with those theoretical frameworks or whatever that who you are as the therapist matters that's what heals people it's one of the most potent aspects of therapy because it releases people it confirms it brings even the most frightened client into the human race if a person can be understood they can belong he says that empathy is a way of being with another person it's a behavioral emotional in the moment applied skill the ideal therapist is first of all empathic he says that Rogers emphasizes this need to sense the client's private world as if it's your own. But the part that's covered a little bit is it says without without losing the as if quality. And you've heard me maybe say this before. It's like you're kind of trying to think of how it's like to be experiencing as if you're them. But you never forget that as if part. You're not them. You're not losing yourself in their identity. You lay aside your views and values in order to enter another person's world without prejudice. In some sense, it means you lie aside yourself. This can only be done by persons who are secure enough in themselves that they will not get lost in what, what might turn out to be the strange or bizarre world of the other and that they can comfortably return to their own world as they wish. So what's he saying here? He's saying like the best therapists are able to kind of adopt or try to Visualize what it's like to be in this other person's world while understanding that they're engaging in a visualizing exercise to help them understand so that they can actually be better make sense of the person and better help from a problem solving perspective. It's an actual technical skill. So I've had some interesting feedback from some of you around like uh, some of the early lectures I did about when I did sort of an overview of some of these people and some people have asked for a little bit more and I thought including it in this presentation is a good spot and also I will as we go through the course because you're going to have a lot of teachers in your time at, at university and you know I have no idea I actually know very little about Nipsing right I, I have a very good opinion of it um, but really I have like one contact person I know who's the dean the dean of CHSF and then uh, Roxana who you probably know and then and then you all and then my group of students from last year so it's like that's basically who i know at nipsing and i don't know why i'm saying that except just to say that like what i'm trying to do with this course is 
I think what hopefully I can add a little bit and sprinkle into your education is just stressing why these ideas matter, who these people were that had them, how they relate to each other, how they're more than just theorists. These are people that really had a huge impact on how we see the mind, how that that has like direct relevance to your own personal mental health, to your own personal processing and decision making and mental optimization to your ability to form strong, healthy, successful relationships and marriages maybe and parenting maybe and again it's like all dependent on what your situation is but like I don't know these ideas are just so much less meaningful if they're not applied and my dream is that that you're you're applying some of these and for example realizing that if you're in a bad mood that some of the reason you're in a bad mood is maybe related to your behavior and that if you got up and went for a walk, you might feel different and that that's actually one of the most advanced findings in psychology, right? It, you maybe have heard me say Carl Jung, the great Carl Jung said that like more people's problems have been cured by a long walk than anything else. It's like that's applied CBT, that your behavior affects your biochemistry, which affects your thought generation, your mood, which affects your thought generation, that those things are intimately connected. Your emotions manifest thoughts, right? And it's why when you're in a bad mood, it's so easy to think of other things to keep you in a bad mood. Yep. Okay, so let's get into this. So the first, the most famous name in the early kind of research into depression was a guy named Aaron Beck, Dr. Aaron Beck, and he really started cognitive therapy. So now think cognitive behavioral therapy is just more recent. So cognitive therapy and what's later going to be called. So I just, so I'm going to talk about CBT, but that quote, I mean, the picture is from his book on cognitive therapy. And I'm just sort of historically making this argument that like he had this idea of cognitive therapy. And then that idea sort of got the word we would use is operationalized where you have a concept and then you turn that concept into like an applied system of therapeutic intervention. You operationalize it. You take it from an idea to something that's usable. Operationalization is like a military word sort of too. But at the heart of this CBT paradigm, there's a simple yet effective working model. So the idea that underlies everything in CBT is that the way that people think about situations influences how they feel and behave. Your thoughts influence your feelings and your behavior. So if people get locked in these negative thought patterns, When you get locked in, de defense, in depressive thought patterns, first of all, you start to experience what we call poverty of thought, which means that you actually get less creative. You actually start having the more, and you probably have experienced this. We've all experienced this in some ways. You're actually, when you're in this negative mood, your thoughts get more repetitive. They get more, um, you're less, actually less likely to have a new unique thought the actual vocabulary even in your thinking, if you're thinking in words or if you're speaking about yourself, your situation, your vocabulary starts to shrink. Now add to that maybe the fact that you're staying in bed longer, you're not eating properly, maybe consuming more than normal other things. It's like all, and you know, I'm not trying to sit here judging, I'm just saying like there's behaviors affecting this, there's thought patterns that are affecting this, there's like if you don't have a regular sleep schedule and you change that to a more regular sleep schedule of getting up at the same time and eliminate afternoon naps, that could have a huge effect on mood. And that's something that's like purely behavior. And so Aaron Beck's pushing this idea of like, you know, so in philosophy, they call it the Descartian or the Cartesian uh, dualism. And, and it's just fancy because way of saying that Descartes had this idea that there's sort of your physical and then there's your mental. And you kind of can see in more recent philosophy this attempt to put mind and body back together and even see people like mind-body training, the Mind-Body Institute, 
all this stuff because it's like obviously you're and then also people just didn't realize what thoughts were do you know that here's an interesting example of that do you know that to the ancients um to the ancient greek and at the greco roman world they thought that your dream was all in the last little bit when you wake up because you know how when you like you've been having a whole night's sleep and then you wake up and maybe you woke up like in the middle of a dream but maybe you didn't so they thought that like all of your dreaming happened in that instant before you wake up right we now know that you dream throughout the night through these cycles and all that kind of stuff but it's like People had these earlier ideas about, like, what even is thought? Like, are thoughts things that you participate in? Are they you? And that's actually a pretty interesting question. A lot of your thoughts are things that you've heard other people say. And... I don't know how I stumbled backwards into this rant, but like in a lot of meditative schools, the idea is negation. And what that means is like to figure out what's your own thought, what you need to do is it's actually impossible to do it in that direction. What you have to do is realize what are other people's thoughts and start realizing like before you say something or before you or while you're thinking about something, think like, like where would this idea be coming from? You start to realize that a lot of it's like, coming from our programming would however you define that and like so then yeah so that's the idea of uh a prophetic knowledge or what's sometimes called negation philosophy if you go on like the stanford encyclopedia of philosophy and look up the idea of negation apophatic knowledge i think it's called but yeah it's basically that idea and then that's important that's actually an important applied idea it's not just oh i remembered some greek word it's like i probably even said it wrong the real idea is that to figure out who you are, you have to figure out who you're not. It's very hard to define who you are. So what do you got to do? You have to start strategically and almost aggressively defining, this is what I'm not. Especially if you're in a state of chaos. And that people can find grounding in that. So anyway, so Beck's talking about this idea of like how our cognitions, we can't talk about our cognitive life and our emotional life and our, than our other life. It's like that makes no sense. It's just you. And right, and as, as you're getting closer to the, the emergence of cognitive psychology taking precedence, we're starting to learn a lot more about things like neurons and the neural connections and your thoughts are do participate biochemically with your brain. There is an argument to be made that there's an aspect of them that are physical, but what does that even mean? It's like, that's even an interesting question, but I'm like six minutes into this slide, so I'll cap off that ramp. But like, I don't know, I hope... fascination is the opposite of bitterness i think staying trying to stay fascinated and interesting and stuff it's like that what keeps your mind young keeps you from being bitter keeps you better to be around for other people when people run into you have like a couple interesting hey did you hear about this new thing that they made that can do this or did you hear about and don't be like oh did you hear the latest covid statistics or whatever and just bring everyone's energy down like everybody else does it's like anyways didn't need to say that see you on the next slide the idea here is just like the famous one of my heroes growing up was Bruce Lee and his famous quote was like to train your mind train your body and to train your body train your mind and that these things are so interconnected that if you if we can help change how you're making sense of things and thinking about things and the repetitiveness of your thoughts and if we can challenge you to think of new fascinating things that that can actually have a change on your behavior and emotions or if we can get you going to bed at a reasonable time and it doesn't even necessarily matter when it's 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 more the consistency of when you wake up in the morning is the most important thing it's like if we can just get you waking up at more regular times and i understand that as like college students your sleep might be all over the place and i have a new newborn so i'm in that boat too but again it doesn't change the fact that if we were sleeping more regular schedules it'd be grounding for us that if our emotions change and you see this all the time it's like you feel overwhelmed and then all of a sudden something happens and you feel more motivated and inspired or you're, you talk to a friend or something and you're in a better mood and now, now all of a sudden what was overwhelming cognitively to you before all these things you need to do it's like eh, i can i can do that it's like so much of it's just you 
you know, this emotive, motivational inspiration, enthusiasm. I didn't even think of what those words even, like enthusiasm means having the spirit inside of you, which is what inspiration literally means too. It's like this idea of like when you're more, you're more than just your thoughts or your behaviors or your your emotions. So when you get locked into one of those patterns, get locked into something that's not helping you and becoming maybe unhealthy. It's like the idea of CBT is to use, utilize skills in the other areas to pull yourself out. Because we know that thoughts get in cycles, but that they're not deterministic cycles. It's like there's no need to assume that you're going to be thinking that way forever. There's no, that'd be an extreme abnormality people don't stay in the same thinking pattern well let me say that differently because people do have an ability to get locked in patterns of thinking but that's what it is it's a pattern of thinking and patterns of thinking have also been shown to be malleable or changeable the whole rationale of cbt is based on the idea that you can change how people think And not from a brainwashing perspective. Although again, I need to contain myself from going on a rant here because we almost brainwash ourselves when we get into these depressed situations with our own messaging. And so breaking out of it is almost like a reverse brainwashing in a a way. It's like a deprogramming. If you're interested in that on this channel, I also have stuff about cults and about deprogramming from cults because I think there's there's a I'm not saying depression is like being in a cult I'm saying that thought getting locked in thought patterns is the comparison I'm saying all right you just witnessed me losing focus live but I'm like four minutes in, so I don't think... I don't know. That's an interesting thought. I'll need to think more about how the the cult connection there. But basically the point I'm just making is like... Your brain is a high-functioning computer that can get locked into patterns. And can get malware. And that needs to be removed. And that's just a metaphor for saying sometimes you can get locked into patterns. And think what malware is on a computer. It's software that's bad for you it's like a maladaptive thinking pattern that it's like it's understandable how you got in that situation but if it's not serving you and there's there's piles of research showing that we can change it then from a cognitive behavioral perspective you can see why they're about then it's about doing the homework it's about doing the work to make the change happen to recognize the patterns that you're in to actually articulate them Right? This is the young idea of like the unconscious energies that get brought into the conscious can be dealt with and let go of. And with all the stuff we're talking about, like this is sort of a simplistic way of looking at it in some ways, but it's actually not. Like our thoughts do have this huge effect on our on our thinking. I mean, or on our emotional state. The relationship between thought and emotion is so complex because emotions sort of are thoughts, but they have this biochemical, physical piece to them and they engage our memory system so uniquely. And But then they can also shape our behavior and we can so say if we're feeling down and then all of a sudden we start acting, we, we don't go out and we you know, skip the shower in the morning and we sleep way in and that that behavior can reinforce that thinking and those those so you get into this you know in, in uh aaron beck would call it this like negative triad of emotion you get in this negative cycle pattern and again why are we talking about this because recognizing the pattern is also the trick to getting out of it because if that pattern can be disrupted Right, if it can be, 
and think of what the word like in the old older use of the word like a psychological intervention is it's trying to get in the, intervene in this pattern in this specific sense right so we have this situation where in our actual experience our life is like this complicated combination of our, our kind of physical self our embodied biology that has these thoughts and that has these experiences of emotional mood and that behaves in certain ways and these are all in this i added those red ones because i think just situation needs to be connected to all those points and it's like these are all happening within this dynamic social world and that's why things are so complicated and that's why things are so complicated for us personally and in our relationships because now you're talking about an intimate relationship with someone and they have their whole own psychodynamic interaction with their social world that now you're engaging with that let alone like a community or a large-scale group so the idea is that all these things are influencing each other and so if someone's in a bad place sometimes influencing change at any of these levels can have an effect through this a butterfly effect kind of through the system so for giants of psychology i don't know yet but some of you might have picked albert ellis and uh if you have you'll find this a little bit extra interesting hopefully and if you haven't and you're not aware of him he was a well first of all he's quite a character you should google some of his videos um on or search some of his videos on youtube and he had this like really he's like kind of one of those eccentric guys he was kind of out there a bit but he was just in terms that he was like a little bit if you watch a youtube interview of him you'll know what i mean he's kind of like an interesting guy and uh but he had this really neat idea and it's very similar to cognitive behavioral therapy and if you look at rational emotive behavioral therapy is well your rational system is part of your cognitive system so it's sort of similar in that sense and then he really adds this emotive component in saying that like it's not just our life that makes us respond certain ways it's how we make sense of our lives and he gets into this abc model that he talks about that i'll show on the next slide but the point i want to make here is like these are some good books the albert ellis reader a, well, a guide to well-being and you'll notice that all these books are similar to the kind of other classic one for depression is mind over mood and that's another one of these applied cognitive behavioral therapy workbooks these are very workbook like so again i'm experimenting with the music in the background to cancel out the fan noise and once this is up on youtube i'll be able to once i listen the final test it's funny when you're making videos it's like it looks great on your computer then it uploads and it's not the way you want it and it's like the final test is if i can make it so that i can watch it on my phone and it looks decent on youtube then that's kind of the the proof is in the pudding and ellis is met I'll, I'll segue from that comment just straight to defining the slide here that albert ellis puts forward this abc model that i kind of started to almost talk about on the last slide where he says you have these events that happen in your life you're driving down the road and someone cuts you off in traffic and he called that an activating event something happens there's something that some action that happens an activating event something happens to start this process and then that how you respond to that is going to be the consequence to that activating event and he says so there's something that happens in your response to what happens but in the middle of that is your belief about it how you make sense of it right and if you were having a terrible day and then this car cuts you off and it's like the last in the long line a list of things that have went bad that day and you get so upset and you're honking your horn flying up behind the guy acting like childish and it's like or maybe you had a totally different day and you just met the love of your life and you just learned you're getting a raise at work and things are all going well at home and the person cuts you off and you're like ah, oh, whatever and you just kind of go back to whatever more pleasant thought you were having that the activating event was the same your belief about it was very different and that had a dramatic shift on your consequence so when the therapeutic intention of, of rebt is to aim at that level of belief how are you what do you believe about your life and you know belief could mean everything from spiritual beliefs to just beliefs 
I shouldn't say just because these are still huge, like beliefs about who you are and how you fit into things and what your capabilities are and your potentials are and who you think other people are and what you think you deserve in relationships and how you think that should manifest and how you make sense of dynamics at work and it's all beliefs in the, within the context of this model. So the idea that Ellis is putting forward is that, you know, on both sides of that model, and this is a fairly basic model, but again, these psychological models that capture an idea in a very simple picture are sometimes very powerful to explain a concept because it's showing here like the a level of this analysis is the same on both sides both sides experience the negative event i'm gonna turn that down a tad just a tad it's getting a little little extra piano -y in here but so the negative events the same on both sides how it's you know, is it interpreted through a rational set of analysis or is it interpreted through an irrational belief system? And that that shapes whether the response to it, you know, it could be a negative event. Your response to it could still be negative, but there's a difference between an irrational negative response and a more rational one, right? You can still have something negative happen, process it in a way that's more based on rational logical thought still think that it's negative but be better able to place it within what's going on instead of having these more irrational emotional laden responses to things these unhealthy negative emotions and so you can see in this like simplified model how ellis's focus was on the b level of analysis looking at the difference between rational and irrational beliefs and how that affects mental health So over this next little bit, we're going to look at these, what I'm calling here, threats to critical thinking. And we're going to look at the idea of emotional decision making and distortion and selective attention, excessive worry, magnifying and, min and minimizing, mind reading, perfectionism and self-defeating thoughts. And we're going to look at these ideas and how there can be threats to our accurately making sense of things and why that's a problem and why kind of the, one of the points of today is so many of the determinants of psychological health are related to being able to get an accurate read of your situation and not be constantly trying to figure out these irrational stories that we we tell ourselves about our lives and that these are some of the ways that human beings tend to make errors in terms of critical thinking and i don't mean critical as in like negative complaining i mean critical as in actually the traditional use of the word is to break something down and look at its aspects. Your emotions are embedded deeply in your system. You're going to respond emotionally to things. You're going to, your experience is going to have emotional content. It's a biochemical reality of being a human being and emotions can and often should play important roles in our decision making, but at times it can become problematic and it becomes problematic when it's getting in the way of us ourselves making the decisions that would bring us towards higher levels of growth or happiness or stability or relationship quality. Emotional decision making is problematic when it results in these negative outcomes or emotions might strongly make us want to see things one way despite disputing evidence, right? Despite the fact that we have all this evidence that shows us other way we're invested in certain ideas or we can the whole point here is that this emotional aspect of our embodied experience can get in the way of us making the highest possible quality decision and it's not really saying that i'm trying to get you to all be trying to be all cold and unemotional but that being able to turn on that cognitive system sometimes and at least understand the first step is like understanding when our emotions affecting our decision making the best example is when you're upset as soon as you get upset that prefrontal cortex gets inhibited by chemicals from your amygdala you start not caring about the consequence of what you're saying so you're in an argument with someone you say something your loved one your parents you say something really mean you're like all mad so that at the time you're like i don't care that i just said that but then later you feel bad because that calms down and the the biochemical inhibition of your prefrontal cortex reduces and all of a sudden you start weighing the consequences of that and you start realizing like maybe i shouldn't have said that it's like 
everyone in the world relates to that example because we've all done it and it's all an example of when our emotional system is interfering with our ability to be logical in the moment the idea here is that the idea here is that there's almost like a functional uh understanding kind of like from trying to understand that there's a important perspective to take you could almost view it as two systems that there's this default mode and then there's this newer more cognitive mode in that our default system is this old brain this rapid processing automatic emotional it's what performs when under stress it's the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate it's that these old parts of the brain these are involved in kind of the quick ability to see and respond but in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and i'm not going to ask you about these names but i just want you to kind of have this idea of there's this idea of this is the newer brain system it's slower processing it's more deliberate it takes more effort your conscious mind is more logical it's more inhibited by stress it's like this is the part of your brain that can do math problems and think through directions and realize what the implications of something would be in that that's a different system than the part of your brain that's making these quick automatic emotional rapid processing style decisions and how your emotions see performs when stressed inhibited by stress the um the difference is how those systems respond to stress and when you're in a, and what is stress right when your blood has this increased amount of cortisol in it and your adrenal system is releasing cortisol and stress hormones and other biochemicals you're dropping into this and this is old brain it's an interesting way of saying it. it's a brain that we share with all mammals and reptiles this this old processing system right and so it's this idea that we can resp when we respond from this highly emo and that makes sense at some ways you can't go through your entire life deeply processing everything you'd never be able to get out the door it's like you have to be able to make part of you becoming having a more mature brain is you're automating more and more and more and more and more But being aware of these two systems is really important. System one's much more judgmental, much more likely to make us make decisions based on pattern recognition than on actually thinking things through. See another type of distortion here, and I just, you know, I tried to use a funny picture of Homer there, but in reality this can be devastating and this happens when for whatever reason and often because of the complexity and the threateningness of the story or the situation people can develop misdorted uh misinterpreted sorry distortions of their reality and based on these faulty assumptions or these cultural biases and this extreme form of delusional thinking can even involve holding beliefs that have no basis in reality that we can actually be our brain has the ability to live the lie a little bit and we need to be aware of that as people interested in psychology and interested in healing other people's psychology the other thing that's key to helping people and to helping ourselves and to yeah ourselves and other people is to understand that we can get into these patterns of selective attention and just think of what that means like only paying attention to certain things only paying attention to information that confirms this bias only paying attention to information that confirms this bias it's like for example we know that if people have low self-esteem they tend to underrate examples so then all of a sudden you, you put them in a scenario where they go in and buy a bag of chips from the person at the counter at a store and they go in and do that you come back and you say how much do you think that that person liked you right and they'll underscore that and they'll also underscore nice things that that person said it's like they're, they're cognitively buying biasing towards a negative interpretation that will keep them in that self-esteem scenario right so if you compare them to a group of people that have higher self-esteem they'll interpret the same stimulus the same reaction from the clerk very differently so i say that for example people with low self-esteem may overlook evidence of their successes and strengths by looking only at their failures and limitations and that's a huge issue 
viewing things through our failures and limitations is like one of our the biggest human challenges we need to avoid. Another threat to critical thinking, and again, I'm just, what I'm trying to do, and I'm not trying to sound like all holier than thou. Here are the ten, here are the eight things, but it's like I've had forty trips around the sun now, and it's like I kind of when people get this is how I'm trying to explain these patterns you get locked into, and in that well, rumination is definitionally a pattern it's this pattern of ruminating to think of the same thing again 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 and then when we get into this depressed emotional state especially when it starts to get fed by these emotional biochemicals that just energizes the process and keeps us in this negative mood and we start to excessive the worry about things and that can actually be a huge in interference to our actually ability to solve the problem or even deal with it directly because we're almost taking ourselves out of the problem solving capacity by worrying about our ability to even do it it's like a self-efficacy issue and sometimes with self-efficacy or uh, sorry sometimes with this excessive worrying it can interfere with problem solving and leads to things like feeling anxious and depressed and helpless and pessimistic and some of that is because when you're not in the problem solving mode everything's overwhelming and so one of the things when you're trying to help people is to increase their problem solving ability and i mean that at like the deepest possible level their ability to respond to their unique challenges in ways that are growth promoting and not maladaptive Unhelpful worrying might involve dwelling on past events or failures or might include focusing on events that may or may not happen in the future. And we all know that and we all know that most of the stuff we've worried about never happened. And we know that, but we still let, our, let ourselves do it. It's not the right way to say it, but we still engage in these patterns of thought. And the point here isn't to make anyone feel bad because getting in patterns of anxiety and depression is like... In some ways, it's harder to understand why everybody doesn't experience it. It's a very understandable state. and to, But a huge part of that state is the, the patterns of thinking and emotion and behavioral uh, embodied experience that goes with it. And that if we can address that, people can get better. I believe that. Another huge threat is... Our ability to scale the urgency of problems and to not downplay huge things and then overplay small things, right? We're like letting some huge problem fester, but we're super worried about getting back to our boss about something that they probably don't even care about. And that it's like, we're not weighing things correctly. This is the classic, like making a mountain out of a molehill like a molehill is really small a mountain is really huge it's like when you're mistaking one for the other it's like that's a problem with your accuracy of vision it's a distortion these type of thinking patterns are just distort facts by extreme or exaggerated forms of thinking this is an important one to include in a presentation like this where we talked so much about empathy is that there's a real power in that and not therapeutic power power in the sense that it changes your communicative ability and ability to actually hear and engage and express yourself but the problem with it can be that we can assume that we're sort of better at the details than we are and that we're actually assuming why people are doing stuff and one of the problems that we get into especially with relationships and marriages or whatever it's like when you get too much into they did this because of this and you're filling in the because of part and it's like we don't always see and understand and even the person themselves can't always articulate the pressures that they're that are influencing them so this so to assume that we can even articulate it fully in ourselves let alone read it in someone else there's a built-in problematic aspect of that idea that this common error arises when people assume they know how others are thinking and feeling but mind reading frequently arises from our own personal insecurities and we tend to read in what we 
we can't distance ourselves from how what we care about and how what we care about your view of me right there's things about your view of me that i might care more about than others and then and so so we didn't just basically what i'm saying is we get into this dangerous scenario when we're assuming we know why people do things for example people with low self-esteem tend to interpret the interactions with other people as being more demonstrative of rejection than a control group does so think about that for a sec that's actually super important to know that when people are feeling low self-esteem they're more likely to interpret a random behavior as rejecting that's a problem that's a problem in how you're processing the situation that's leading you to be more likely to stay in that unhealthy state And then this is probably an issue some of you deal with as high functioning, like successful students. And it's like something I have had to learn too. Is like, I'm not an expert video maker. I don't have an editing team. I'm doing this all just in PowerPoint. It's like, there's going to be, I'm going to say oh, a few times and like, and I'm going to get lost on rants sometimes. And it's like, I'm still going to do the best job I can to be a decent teacher for you and to present these topics as well as I can. And I'm going to let go of the need to be I couldn't be if I wanted to and I'm not going to try to be perfect and it's like it takes a while to kind of let go of this idea that you need to be 100% all the time that sometimes you coming through at 80% is great that, that healthy individuals set realistic challenging achievable goals are motivated to do their best maintain high standards all that stuff that's similar but perfectionists can get and perfect again these are all it's not like boom you're a perfectionist you're not it's like we all can participate in these tendencies and get into scenarios where we're setting unrealistic standards of achievement with this expectation of constant success and then we create this like self-judgment system where we're setting the bar for what's acceptable and what isn't and we're almost setting ourselves up to not be able to meet that bar now here's the thing it's like the way to better yourself and the way to set yourself up for this perfectionist thing are similar it's some of its perspective some of its how gentle you're being on yourself realizing like you're all great students you're all very academically uh, capable it's like you know especially like say for example with some of your projects like you're doing videos and stuff i don't I'm not expecting it completely polished you know, sometimes when people like make a mistake and make a joke about the mistake they just made and roll with it it's like sometimes that's cool too it's like no one well perfectionist individuals are under this constant stress caused by the anxiety to perform or have the realization that they failed to reach this sustained unrealistic expectation of self you're already good trust yourself you're good students Okay, so Ellis, the guy that we've been talking about here in REBT, the Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, kind of. And you know, I can be guilty of this myself, and we can all get into this scenario where we get negative. And I've made the point before that, like, one of the biggest challenges in your life is to avoid getting bitter and negative, especially when there's so many things to be upset about. And it's like the people around you need you to stay not fake positive but positive and optimistic despite the challenges and in rbt rebt they really focus on this idea of taking extreme ownership and responsibility over being disciplined in our thinking and not letting our thoughts go there and realizing that yeah sometimes we're going to be down and it's going to be almost unavoidable but there's going to be times where we can exert control and where we can ex exert control it's important that we do because as you do that you'll Get better at doing that and then the amount of times where your ability to affect it is relevant will increase and, and increase and increase and increase and we can call that like increasing your self-regulation or maturity or emotional control or whatever you want but it's basically this idea of being able to control your state in the moment being able to use things like being interested and fascinating with things is almost like psychological defenses against just being bitter and upset it's not that people don't have reasons to be upset but it's even more so if you do have reasons it's even more important to challenge because you're all smart people to challenge yourselves to 
increase your positive mental content and with the belief that that will pull the system up. I can't think of a better way to say that, but that's basically what I mean. In terms of practical advice, one of the best ideas that comes from this line of psycho psychological thinking is this idea of thought stopping. And this is one of these things that's not rocket science, but it's when applied, it's incredibly powerful. And this idea of to help yourself or to help other people, you're really wanting to get them better at recognizing when they're starting to go down these bad spirals, recognizing when they're starting to think about the same thing over and over, recognize when they're starting to allow these negatively biased interpretations to start painting their interpretation of their experience that that to the extent that we can control it we stop as much as we can and that, that we can actually get better at this and I was talking about this a bit the last slide but the technique in cognitive behavioral therapy that you could look up is called thought stopping and they actually do that by getting you to start to write out things and there's like exercises you do it's like a, the idea is that it's a cognitive behavioral skill technique therapy therapeutic technique that you can get better at doing and that as you get better at doing it actually starts to rewrite rewrite some of the neural pathways and start to actually what that actually means is start to change some of those patterns of thinking thought stopping is a technique for interrupting these repetitive on types of unhelpful thinking that impede or gets in the way of our action and replacing it with confidence or that gets in the way of our action and having confidence and replacing it with powerful, more empowering substitutes. And it's like, it's going to feel a bit forced at first. And then because you're trying to recalibrate, reset a system that's too biased to the negative, and you'd be doing this with the therapist or whatever, and that, or you could be doing this with a workbook like Mind Over Mood, which is awesome. And I'd recommend checking out, it's just Mind Over Mood. Pachowski or something like that is the author. I can't think off the top of my head. Mind over mood. It's like a white and green workbook. After identifying negative self-talk, clients need to develop positive statements to, to start to replace some of those negative thoughts. So again, it's this idea of noticing where you tend to go off course, figuring out what to do when that happens, having substitutes ready and practicing using those substitutes to the point that that feels more and more natural and eventually that becomes the new pathway and all of a sudden you're thinking more healthy and it's not just easy as that that's actually tough but that's actually a pathway that can work what does discipline really mean you know besides waking up early and how do i employ it to all aspects of my life what does it really mean Yes, discipline, it, it, it does start with waking up early. It really does. But that is just the beginning. And I always say that discipline is the root of all good qualities. But you, you have to absolutely apply it to things outside of just waking up early. It's, it's everything. It's working out every day, making yourself stronger and faster and more flexible and healthier. Discipline is eating the right foods to fuel your system. It, it's about disciplining your emotions so you can make good decisions. It's about having the discipline to control your ego so your ego doesn't get out of hand and control you. It's about treating people the way you would want to be treated and, and doing the tasks that you don't necessarily want to do but that you know will help you or help your team. It's about facing your fears. It takes discipline to face your fears so you can conquer them. And that's what discipline is. Discipline means taking the hard road, the uphill road to do what's right for yourself and for other people. It's so often the easy path 
the easy path that calls to us to be weak for that moment, to break down for that moment, to give in to the desire and the short-term gratification. But the discipline will not allow that. The discipline calls for strength and fortitude and will. It won't accept weakness. It won't tolerate another breakdown. The discipline can seem like it's your worst enemy. But the reality is, Discipline is your best friend. It will take care of you like nothing else can. And it'll put you on that path. The path to strength and health and intelligence and happiness. And most importantly, it'll put you on that path to freedom. So another idea I want to talk about, and this is an interesting one, like mindfulness is an idea that's been around for a while. Like I can remember seeing the kind of one of the, first of all, it relates to ancient Buddhist meditative practices that have been around for thousands of years, but it kind of came on the scene in the West through the writings of this guy named John Kabat-Zinn and uh, Full Catastrophe Living was the name of the book. I remember him doing like talks at University of Waterloo and I've seen him speak and he's a very interesting guy and this then this mindfulness stuff also went very new agey with some people and you can find a wide range of people teaching and practices related to mindfulness that go all the way from like pretty legit to pretty illegit but at the most basic it's this idea that oftentimes our psychological upset lies in either focusing too much on things that might happen in the future or ruminating or thinking over and over and over again about things that happened in the past and that there's actually a therapeutic benefit to staying in the moment and you know I define it there as awareness of the present experience with acceptance the intention is for participants so people training in mindfulness to not only bring their awareness to the present moment but also to become aware of the tendency to not be in the present moment that you start to the goal or the value of mindfulness is that by just even trying to stay focused you realize how quick how first of all how difficult that is how quick your mind is to try to you know in buddhism they called it like the thousand running horses or thousand wild monkeys it's like you're trying to keep your mind focused and it's like what about supper you gotta call this person back what about this worry about this worry about this worry about this and you start to realize that First of all, who you are, you start to see, you start to witness your thoughts. And then that brings up a very interesting question. Who's witnessing your thoughts? What's that even mean? I'll leave you with that one. Right, but that it helps people to disengage from their worry about the past uh, and whatever kind of current future problems that often, especially future problems that might not occur, often don't occur. But again, it's the same reason why being in a great conversation with a friend or any of these kind of flow experiences, being really in the groove at a game or like a sport game or playing an instrument at a concert or when you're engaged at that level in the moment, there's a therapeutic energy associated with that. I just like showing this picture sometimes. It's like a picture's worth a thousand words. You see the dog sitting there or you see the person there. He's like going to walk into the park and he's thinking about maybe his wife and his kids and issues with his car and that there's bills coming through the door and he has to see their speaker stand and mike maybe has to do a presentation he's worried about and you know there's all there's some unhappy person there that's maybe some issue at work and their socks maybe he's thinking about that he has to do laundry but you can just see how his mind's like full of all this stress and strain and then you see the dog and the dog's looking forward and seeing the trees and the sun. And, you know, it's just trying to kind of illustrate this idea. And you see this if you have kids big time. It's like when I walk down the street with my daughter and she's like noticing like there's a cool colored piece of gravel like in the sidewalk. Or like just something that as an adult we would never notice. But 
there's an idea that being so in the moment, at least for periods of time, can provide a break from the pattern and the strain associated with the pattern. In the last 10 years, there's been some very interesting developments in evolutionary biology, neurocognitive science, child development research, and many other fields, which is beginning to challenge some of these long-held shibboleths that we've had about human nature and the meaning of the human journey. But there is another frame of reference emerging in the sciences, which is quite interesting. It really challenges these assumptions. And with that, the institutions that we have created based on those assumptions, our educational institutions, our business practices, our governing institutions, etc., let me take you back to the early 1990s, sleepy little laboratory in Parma, Italy, and scientists had a MRI brain scanning machine on a macaque monkey as the macaque monkey was trying to open up a nut. They wanted to see how the neurons would light up. So the monkey's trying to open up the nut, the neurons light up, and just by serendipity, and this is how science sometimes happens, a human being walked into the laboratory, I don't know if it was by mistake, and he was hungry, he saw the nuts and opened up one of the nuts and tried to crack it open. The macaque monkey was totally shocked because who was this invader in his laboratory? And he didn't move. He just gazed at this human trying to open up the nut, just like he had done a few seconds earlier. And then the scientist looked on the MRI brain scanner. The same exact neurons were lighting up when he observed the human being opening the nut as when the monkey opened the nut. And the scientists had not a clue as to what this was. They thought the MRI machine had broken. They then began to put MRI brain scanning machines on other primates, especially chimpanzees with our big, big neocortex. Then they went to humans. And what they found over and over again is something called mirror neurons. And that is that we are apparently soft-wired, some of the primates, all humans. We suspect elephants. We're not sure about dolphins and dogs. We've just begun. But all humans are soft-wired with mirror neurons so that if I'm observing you, your anger, your frustration, your sense of rejection, your joy, whatever it is, and I, I can feel what you're doing, the same neurons will light up in me as if I'm having that experience myself. Now, this isn't all that unusual. We know if a spider goes up someone's arm and I'm observing it going up your arm, I'm going to get a creepy feeling. We take this for granted, but we are actually soft-wired to actually experience another's plight as if we are experiencing ourselves. But mirror neurons are just the beginning of a whole range of research going on in neuropsychology and brain research and in child development that suggests that we are actually soft-wired, not for aggression and violence and self-interest and utilitarianism, that we are actually soft-wired for sociability, attachment, as John Bowlby might have said, affection, companionship, and that the first drive is the drive to actually belong. It's an empathic drive. What is empathy? It's very complicated. When little babies are in a nursery and one baby cries, the other babies will cry in response. They just don't know why. That's empathic distress. It's built into their biology. Around two and a half years of age, a child actually can begin to recognize himself in a mirror. That's when you begin to mature empathy as a cultural phenomenon. And that is once a, a toddler can identify themselves, then they know that if they're observing someone else have a feeling, they know that if they feel something, it's, it's because they're feeling it because someone else has it. They're two separate beings. Selfhood goes together with empathic development. Increasing selfhood, increasing empathic development. Around eight years of age, a child learns about birth and death. They learn where they came from, that they have a one and only life, that life is fragile and vulnerable, and one day they're going to die. That's the beginning of an existential trip. Because when a child learns about birth and death and they have a one and only life, they realize how fragile and vulnerable life is. It's very tough being alive on this planet, whether you're a human being or a fox navigating the forest. So when a child learns that life is vulnerable and fragile and that every moment is precious and that they have their own unique history, it allows the child then to experience another's plight in the same way, that that other person or other being, could be another creature, has a one and only life, it's tough to be alive, and the odds are not always good. So if you think about the times that we've empathized with each other, our fellow creatures, it's always because we felt their struggle. We have the width of death and empathy and the celebration of life and we show solidarity with our compassion. Empathy is the opposite of utopia. There is no empathy in heaven. I guarantee you, I'll tell you before you get there. There isn't any empathy in heaven because there's no mortality. 
There's no empathy in utopia because there is no suffering. Empathy is grounded in the acknowledgement of death and the celebration of life and rooting for each other to flourish and be. It's based on our frailties and our imperfections. So when we talk about building an empathic civilization, we're not talking about utopia. We're talking about the ability of human beings to show solidarity, not only with each other, but our fellow creatures who have a one and only life on this little planet. We are homo empathicus. So here's the question. We know that consciousness changes in history. The way our brain is wired today is not the way a medieval serf's brain would be wired, and their brain wouldn't be the same as the wiring of a forager hunter 30,000 years ago. So the question I asked at the beginning of this study six years ago is, how does consciousness change in history? Because I wanted to imagine the following proposition. Is it possible that we human beings who are soft-wired for empathic distress, is it possible we could actually extend our empathy to the entire human race as an extended family and to our fellow creatures as part of our evolutionary family and to the biosphere as our common community? If it's possible to imagine that, then we may be able to save our species and save our planet. And when I say to you tonight, if it's impossible to even imagine that, I don't see how we're going to make it. Empathy is the invisible hand. Empathy is what allows us to stretch our sensibility with another so that we can cohere in larger social units. To empathize is to civilize. To civilize is to empathize. With forage or hunter societies, communication only extended to the local tribe, and shouting distance. Everyone over in the next mountain was the alien other. So empathy only extended to blood ties. When we went to the great hydraulic agricultural civilization, script allowed us to extend the central nervous system and to annihilate more time and space and bring more people together. And the differentiation of skills and the increasing selfhood not only led to theological consciousness, but empathy now extended to a new fiction. And that is, instead of just associating with one's blood ties, we detribalized and began association based on religious ties. So a new fiction, Jews start to see all other Jews as extended family and empathize with Jews. Christians start to see all other Christians as extended family and empathize with Christians. Muslims, the same. When we get to the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, and we extend markets now to larger areas and create a fiction called the nation state. And all of a sudden, the Brits start to see others in in Britain as extended family. The Germans start to see Germans as extended family, the Americans as Americans. There was no such thing as Germany. There was no such thing as France. These are fictions. But they allow us to extend our family so that we can have loyalties and identities based on the new complex energy communication revolutions we have that annihilate time and space. But if we have gone from empathy in blood ties to empathy in, in religious associational ties, to empathy based on national identification, is it really a big stretch to imagine the new technologies allowing us to connect our empathy to the human race writ large in a single biosphere? And what reason would we stop here at the nation-state identity and only have ideological empathy or theological-based empathy or tribal-based blood tie empathy? We have the technology that allows us to extend the central nervous system and to think viscerally as a family, not just intellectually. When that earthquake hit Haiti and then Chile, but especially Haiti, within an hour the Twitters came out and within two hours some cell phone videos, YouTube, and within three hours the entire human race was in an empathic embrace coming to the aid of Haiti. If we were, as the Enlightenment philosophers suggested, in materialistic, self-interested, utilitarian, pleasure-seeking, it couldn't account for the response to Haiti. Apparently, 175,000 years ago in the Rift Valley of Africa, there were about 10,000 anatomically modern human beings walking the grasslands, our ancestors. The geneticists located one database woman. It's a database line. Apparently, her genes passed to everyone in this room tonight. The other ladies didn't make it. It gets even more strange. They, they located a single male. This is a database line for genetics. They call him the Y chromosome Adam, apparently a fairly potent guy. His genes passed to everyone in this room. So here's the news. 6.8 billion people at various stages of consciousness, theological, ideological, psychological, dramaturgical, we're all fighting with each other with different ideas about the world. And guess what? We all came from two people. The Bible got this one right. We could have come from many. But the point is we have to begin thinking as an extended family. We have to broaden our sense of identity. We don't lose the old identities of nationhood and our religious identities.
and even our blood ties. But we extend our identity so we can think of the human race as our fellow sojourners and our other creatures here as part of our evolutionary family and the biosphere as our community. We have to rethink the human narrative. If we are truly homo empathicus, then we need to bring out that core nature because if it doesn't come out and it's repressed by our parenting, our educational system, our business practice and government, the secondary drives come, the narcissism, the materialism, the violence, the aggression. If we can have a global debate, let it start here from the British Royal Society for the Arts, which apparently you're doing, to begin rethinking human nature, to bring out our empathic sociability so that we can rethink the institutions of society and prepare the groundwork for an empathic civilization. So, thanks for watching this week's installment on uh, what I was calling determinants of psychological health. I hope you got something out of it. I tried to tailor this one a little bit less like a research report and a little bit more, I don't know, personal or like just focused on how to apply this to actually kind of get through this, some of the complexities that we're all dealing with these days. Love teaching this class. Hope you're doing well. Great students. I really um, value this this uh, engagement that we have so cheers have a great week i'll see you soon next presentation is on uh, the second part on intimacy on in infancy looking more at the social and emotional changes that happen catch you there